Oh my goodness, has it been a while. Um, if you're listening, hello, welcome back. <laughs> um, as you guys know, it's been about a three-month hiatus of Sports Talk Mostly podcast due to, as we know, COVID-19 closures across the nation, actually across the globe, um, pretty much halted all sports activity known to man. Um, I mean, we missed out on so much stuff, like obviously multiple NBA games. It sh- we should be in NBA finals right now. Um, NHL hockey was canceled. Uh, McDonald's All-American High School basketball game was canceled. MLB major and minor leagues were canceled. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. Um, high school Spring sports pretty much canceled uh, all throughout the nation. I don't think any high school spring sports got to play at all, as well as collegiate spring sports. I don't believe anybody got to play. I think that there was a little bit of collegiate baseball and softball that was just starting to get kicked off right when everything started to close. But other than that, uh, sports stopped at like March 20th-ish. So... The fact that the podcast is even back is a huge deal, um, and we do have some sports news, so we'll start with that. We're we're gonna stay with the regular um, podcast format um, of news, interview, culture, and hopefully you guys liked that. <laughs> and if you don't know or haven't noticed or don't follow the show on social media, you should do that. But also. I announced a new installment for the show called Secret Segment, and that is a separate interview with every episode's interview guest, and basically just covering 10 random questions, um, kind of like rapid fire with the interview guest, and um, those questions are going to allow you guys to get to know the interview guests just a little bit better. So these first few episodes back are going to be a little bit shorter than um, episodes have been in the past. Obviously, we don't have a whole lot to talk about, um, but want to just keep things concise and really focus on the things that need um, attention, so to speak. And of course, the classic cat is back. I don't know if you guys could hear that. The cat is messing with some stuff. So if you have been a long time Sports Talk Mostly podcast listener, you know that because I create the podcast from my home, DIY podcast life. (laughs) Um, My cat Enyo is a pretty big part of distractions that come along with the show. So sorry in advance if you don't like the cat, but she's here to stay. So it is what it is. Um, But this episode is really exciting for me. I have um, Nitsan Blavstein from Actually, she's a freelancer with The Athletic. She's going to be the interview portion today talking about her fund that she just started with her co-founder, Want Not Need Fund is the name of that. And um, she's just going to talk a little bit about that in the interview. So make sure to stick around and catch that. Definitely don't want you guys to miss out on that. And of course, the train's coming by now too. I mean, no sports talk, mostly podcast would be complete without the cat or the train. <laughs> it's what it is. I feel like every single time I start filming, either one of these things just kind of presents themselves. So, anyways, like I said, kicking off with a little bit of news, um, we had UFC uh, 250 um, last weekend. So, and that was the big fights. There were Asun Sao versus Garbrandt and Nunez versus Spencer. Um, I think everybody thought that Nunez versus Spencer would kind of be a shoe in for Nunez. Um, obviously, Spencer's tough, but um, Nunez, Nunez held her five rounds and came out with a W on that one. She is the first female UFC fighter to hold one title while defending the other title. Um, so she has had a challenger for one of her titles that she actually, um, defeated the challenger. So she's the first female fighter to ever do that. Um, definitely big ups to Nunez on that. She's, she's so tough, man. Um, you know, Ronda Rousey paved the way for a lot of people, but Nunez has just proved to be 
like, so true to form and so, you know, walks it like she talks it, man. Um, you know, that's no diss to Rhonda. Obviously, Rhonda is a tough, tough woman. But I think Nunes does it just a little bit better than Rhonda. So <laughs> don't hate me for that. But that's my opinion. Um, a Sun Sound versus Garbrandt, that was a great fight. I thought it would be a little bit more competitive than it actually turned out to be. Um, I don't know if you guys caught that, but I thought that that Garbrandt KO is definitely eligible for a KO of the year um, as far as UFC yearly awards go. <laughs> I think that that was um, just, just a crazy hit. I mean, I don't know, if, like I said, if you guys saw it, but Garbrandt pretty much just kept his eyes on the prize, uh, bent down, came back up swinging, it didn't take his eyes off of Sun Sal for not even a second, and just clocked him right in the jaw and put him out. Um, afterwards, they tried to sit a Sun Sal on a, <laughs> on a stool, and poor guy, he couldn't even sit correctly on the stool. Uh, they they pulled him off the stool and told him to sit back down on the octagon floor. <laughs> so um, that was definitely amusing. Great set of fights there. Um, just my personal take, I think it's super weird. So quiet with no fans in, in the arena. Obviously, it's necessary given the circumstances of everything right now. But um, just su super weird. And also, I mean, I have to tip my hat to Bruce Buffer. I think that he does such an incredible job of still putting on the show that people want to see from Bruce Buffer, um, but doesn't change up the fact that he's not talking to anybody in the audience. So I think it would be really hard to keep that same enthusiasm without audience members. Um, and he does a really good job of it. So shouts to Bruce, Bruce Buffer for that. Um, also, about a month or so ago, we had UFC 249. Um, it was the second fight uh, we saw from Pettis and Cerrone. And then we also had uh, Justin Gaethje versus Ferguson. And um, Pettis defeated Cerrone. Gaethje defeated Ferguson. Personally, I wasn't surprised by either one of those. So, again, super great fights. Those were the ones that were in Florida. Those were the first of the UFC fights during COVID-19, um, with the Florida Athletic Commission being a little bit more lenient than the other states as far as their regulations go for holding um, athletic events. So that's the reason that was allowed to happen at such a soon time, so to speak. Um, if you're not watching on video, I put air quotes around <laughs> soon time because I don't think that it was soon at all. Um, I think that a lot of these sports could have continued um, without fans. I mean, not team sports, but these individual type sports with one-on-one -on -one fighters. I think a lot of them could have continued without fans, but I do appreciate the precautions taken by all the various, you know, presidents, aka Dana White, um, to just kind of keep the athletes safe, keep everybody, I mean, keep the risk of lawsuits down. <laughs> you don't want anybody getting sick and then suing you because they participated in an athletic event at your hands. So, um, you know, lots of different factors here that are influencing the way that these things are carried out. So it's definitely going to be curious to see how UFC continues to... Um, work around the various regulations in every state that they intend to hold fights in, or location, I guess, they tend to hold fights in. So, um, also big news, like kind of I just mentioned at the beginning of the show, the return of the NBA. <clears throat> um, it, it sounds like they were first slated to come back July 30th. Sounds like they're going to maybe start a little bit sooner on July 29th or 30th, which is only one or two days, obviously, but... Um, the sooner the better, in my opinion. Um, if you listen to the interview later on with Nitz, you will hear some of her opinions about that, um, which I don't disagree with, but it's, it's going to be curious. Um, I think a lot of the players want to play, but definitely... I mean, it's got to be so hard containing, like, what, 1,500 people to... Like stay in isolation during <laughs> the, the, the 
time that they're going to carry out the rest of the season and playoffs. I don't know. Um, just seems like a lot of work. Seems like a lot of work. So hopefully everybody can stay healthy. But um, finals would end like right around mid-October. Going to be 22 teams, eight games before playoffs start. Um, traditional conference-based playoffs are going to happen um, once playoffs does start. And then um, after all of this ends, the 2020-2021 season would start December 1st. So next year's season would obviously start, I think, a couple of months. Usually season starts at the beginning of October. Um, so... Makes everything a little weird from here on out for the next year or so, but at least we get basketball back. I think I was, <laughs> was talking to somebody earlier about this, but this whole thing has just been so weird because typically when anything is shut down or anything like that, we have sports to turn to and kind of occupy our time and our minds. And with sports shut down too, you just don't, you don't get that. So, um... The distraction that sports provides has not been here, and I think that's been tough for a lot of people. It's been tough for myself, um, so definitely going to be nice to have the NBA back. Um, there's also been talk of potential return of the WNBA, which would mean a potential late July start time frame for the WNBA, um, if that does happen, and um, they're... Their player payments, you know, guaranteed contracts um, got their payments June 1st. So it is nice that the WNBA is at least playing, pay, excuse me, paying rather <laughs> their players, even though the season hasn't started yet. Um, it's just such a weird time for all these players. I mean, yes, they make a lot of money. They make a lot of money to do what they do. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that not playing or not having an entire season um, is something that's like financially acceptable for a lot of these people. So uh, they still have families to support. They still have people that depend on them um, and their income. Um, so, you know, it's definitely not something that is ideal for any family at all to go without like an entire season of work. So, I just hope that something good comes of all of this. There's also talk of um, MLB creating a schedule um, that the players abide to. I think that um, I was talking with a good friend that works at a major sports network, and um, both of us agree that a lot of the MLB players probably won't be playing. Don't blame them for that. Um, it's just not safe, and money is the object, obviously, for a lot of these owners, and they just don't care. The players are the ones putting themselves on the line for the owners to make all of that money. So, um, I don't know as far as you guys as listeners go, but I, as a sports fan and a former athlete, I definitely side with the players on this one. I mean, I think that we need to be smart. We need to, I mean, this, the, the coming seasons won't happen if athletes aren't healthy. So <laughs> I think that gets overlooked from time to time as far as the bigger picture goes. So um, like I said, a few different talking points there, but hopefully some good stuff comes of these leagues starting back up, players getting to play the games that they love, <clears throat> and... Hopefully sports can give us the unity that we need to see. Not necessarily a distraction, but definitely a way to pull people from different cultures together and have something positive to talk about. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, if you did not already, you should go check out the secret segment 10 question bonus interview with Nissan Bluffstein and then come back because her interview to talk about want not need fun is going in right here so stay tuned hello 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 sports talk mostly podcast is back with our episode nine interview guest this is Nick. She is a freelancer, um, mostly well-known with The Athletic. Um, she's in the segment The Daily Dings, and also recently just started a fund called Want Not Need Fund, 
And that's going to be kind of the basis of our topics today. But Nick, go ahead, say hello to the audience, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name's Nitz. I am a person. We already we talked about this like offline and like on the other segment, which is secret, so I won't say anything. But uh, I have no idea how to introduce myself. I freelance. I do things. I also talk sports occasionally, and then do a lot of other things. Uh, I like the sound of my own voice. And <laughs> I recently started uh, What Not Need Fun, which has just been like the. I'm allowed to cuss on this one too, right? Yeah, go for it. So it's just been like the coolest fucking thing because I, I mean, we could get into it in a little bit, but it was one of yeah. those, we know the power of Twitter and social media and the following right. that we amass for nothing. Um, but I think this was really like the, like, yeah. the sorry, I'm like trying not to be distracted, but my boyfriend's walking across the room. Anyways. <laughs> hi, boyfriend. <laughs> That's hi, boyfriend. Um, but yeah. <laughs> it's all good <laughs> all right so to start and i i know a little bit about you but obviously i'm interviewing you because the audience probably doesn't so talk a little bit about your personal background and upbringing and your journey to where you are now as far as geographically yeah, I've lived in, well, I think it's a ton of places. And I talk to people that have really lived in a ton of places. I'm like, maybe not. But I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Israel in Tel Aviv. Um, my dad's job and really like, by pressure of my parents moved us to California when I was like around eight and a half, nine. I was in the Bay Area for basically that whole time, college in California, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, sorry, one second, he's moving across the room. And then... <laughs> my bad anyways then we moved back so we moved to California and then I at one point really felt like I wanted to go back to Israel I moved back to Israel after college I did something called Aliyah which means to go up and it's like a very official government thing where they give you government assistance to move back and it's it's a whole thing that I'm not even going to get into ah. didn't work it was dope I put in a lot of effort to do it didn't work out I think that was one of my first real experiences with like accepting failure that like something you so desperately wanted just wasn't the right fit for you right. um and I didn't know where to go next so I had a friend in New York I literally bought a ticket put my 30-day notice on my lease in Israel and then moved to New York slept on her couch I had like 30 days to find a job so that I could afford rent so I didn't have to move back home to the bay I found a job I was with them for four years and then two or three years into it I moved to LA to work for the same company uh -huh. and then now I've been freelancing for literally a year now a year wow. and like three days and something so yeah that's where I'm at and now I'm, you know sorry that was like a lot of information no that's, that's the story of how I ended up in LA which is just you know the basketball world is here so it's kind of like yeah. the natural progression to be closer to friends and the industry etc right so um for those of you who missed it Nitz talked on the secret segment about um, how old she was when she learned English. Talk a little bit about that and how old you were and your kind of, obviously you had to learn English because your family moved over here, but talk a little bit about what that was like for you and those cultural changes. Well, it sucked because English is like the worst language to learn. So stupid. There's just no, there's no rules behind it. And Hebrew is, I don't know which one, I don't, you know how people are like, it's a Latin language. It's, I don't know what the hell Hebrew is, but Hebrew has, <laughs> Hebrew has rules. So I know that there's like, this is for female, this is for male. This is like, you know, if there's a root of the word, I could use that root of the word to describe another thing that relates to it. Whereas English is just like memorization essentially. Yeah. And it, things like, there's just a ton of exceptions that I had a really hard time getting used to and ESL programs aren't properly funded. So I just remember moving like the first day of third grade. So in Israel, at least when you're like in elementary school, there's only one break for lunch and school days are shorter. Mm -hmm. Here you have recess, then you have lunch. So 
first break of the day. I'm a dumb little third grader. What do I know? I grab my lunch because I'm like, well, it's the one break that we have. And the teacher takes it away from me and is like, no, not yet, later. And I just bawled my eyes out because I have no idea what this woman is telling me. I'm just like, this woman took my food. I ran to all of my friends in the yard and I'm like crying my eyes out. None of them know what's happening. They're all crying their eyes out. And it was just like, and they were all, I grew up in luckily like the Bay Area has hella Israeli immigrants. So it was easy to just like speak Hebrew to people. And and I got kicked out of, not kicked out, I got pushed out of ESL because they could only, like, really sponsor or whatever. They they were only, like, one program for the year. So I did it in third grade. Fourth grade moved into normal English speaking, which was a nightmare because I didn't know English. And I remember I had a very terrifying teacher who was tenured and just, like, yelled a lot and just couldn't do anything about it. And he told us to write every other line. And I don't know what the, that's like, what the what fuck? Is- yeah, I barely knew what line was, sir. So like, he was like, write every other line. And I didn't do it. And he yelled at me and just like, wouldn't take my paper. And I had no idea what was going on until I like had to ask friends, like, what the fuck did I do wrong? So not the best experience. And then, right. you know, I would say the biggest cultural difference when you're a kid moving here is everybody knows that stupid bill song. That's like how to, what, I don't know what the song is. It's about a bill. That's all. What? No. Oh, is it? It's when a bill <laughs> trying, to tell you the song? trying to tell me what it is. It's literally when a bill is like how to create a bill or something. And it's a dancing animated bill. Oh, are you talking about the government how to create a bill song? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Everybody knew that. And I'm like, what is happening? And I know that that's a really dumb cultural gap, but it was this moment of like, you guys all grew up on this stuff. I grew yeah. up on in a completely different world, mind you, during like the second intifada. Less, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So there was, you know, there was a lot to like assimilate to, but eventually, you know, my accent caught up, my English caught up and um, I'm still not fully culturally caught up on anything, but. <laughs> I mean, aren't any of us really? Come on. No. So I was going to say, your English is really great. Like, I feel like for a lot of people that meet you now, do they do they even really realize that you are an Israel Im- Israeli immigrant unless you tell them? Or no. yeah. I also like with Israelis, I don't necessarily look Israeli. I think people say that I look Jewish, which comes with its own host of things that I would get into, but <laughs> too much time. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I have... I just, I don't look Israeli. So people don't necessarily know. Right. Um, but I, really I say, that Pacific Islander. A lot of people are like, you don't look Pacific Islander. And oh. I'm like. Yeah, exactly. People are like, well, you don't. And I'm like, well, well, sucks, buddy. Cause I grew up there. So like, <laughs> I still am <laughs> like, I'm sorry to like break it to you. Um, but you know, there's always that, like <laughs> you're half and half. Cause nobody believes you that you're like from a certain place, but also like Americans say like you're not fully American but then Israelis will be like you're not fully Israeli so it's a lot of like okay what am I then <laughs> yeah I'm a Twitter user that's the best way I love the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna chill here on my little boat and just like have no country I don't know but in American territory the other foot in Eastern European territory <laughs> yeah, yeah East, there you go I'm from my uh whatever I like I don't really know where I'm at what I am but I'm technically Eastern European who the hell knows right right I know it's so funny yeah. so yeah so many technical terms too much PC for me I can't deal with it <laughs> um you mentioned uh, a little bit ago moving to LA just to be closer to basketball and obviously NBA, you know, people and professions and things like that. What do you think uh, drew you to sports the most as you grew up, even through living in Israel? Um, well, my dad was a huge basketball fan and mm-hmm. my dad's one of my best friends. The other mm-hmm. one is my mom. Um, so, like not to be lame, but they are my best friends. I love that. Um, so, you know, it was like an easy way to bond with him. And then when I moved to Israel, it was just like a very, very easy way to keep in touch with everyone. Like all of my friends grew up huge Warriors fans. A lot of them huge Lakers fans. The stereotype with the Bay Area can be true, whatever. So like. Okay, Anna it, Melissa and Vic, yeah. whatever. <laughs> oh, I love them. They're not from the Bay, but that's true. But then I am. Um, <laughs> huge Lakers fans. <laughs> huge Lakers fans so I you know so whatever it was an easy time it was an easy way to keep in touch and then 
the time that I moved, I think it was a 2014, 2015 season. So the Warriors, you know, were having their champ, their first championship in like 40 years. Everyone in the Bay was so excited about it. So like keeping in touch with the Bay and like everyone. And then I moved to New York and I kind of, I was like, well, this is super cool. But I want to, instead of just being a Warriors fan, I want to be like an NBA fan. So I did little Knicks things here and there. And I like did like Knicks, like, you know, like blog social. I did the Knicks wall for a little bit, things like that. And it's just like, right. you know, I became obsessed with the sport <laughs> as a whole and not just my team. And then it was also just a good way to like, you know, during those warrior seasons where they were so good that it was almost like obnoxious to watch. I had yeah. like little pet teams, like the Blazers, where I'd be like, go Blazers and go Raptors and things. I'm always the Blazers. <laughs> that's why I love Blazers fans. And that's how I like, I pick a pet team. It sounds so dumb, but I pick a pet team to root for. And like the Blazers were it like a couple of years ago. So it was, and you guys are, have such a great fandom, but it was easy to just like bond with everyone. Totally. Yeah. Blazers Twitter is the best, honestly. And I was seriously, I know it was a rumor for a while before we actually acquired and signed Mello, but I was like so proud of Blazers front office <laughs> when they made that signing because to hear those rumblings as a Blazers fan, and obviously we have the Sam Bowie curse, the Greg Oden curse. So to hear... Oh, rumblings, you're just like listing curses. That is very Blazers. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. fact that I can list more than one is awful. Mm -hmm. But to hear those rumblings and then actually have it come to fruition was like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like something finally as a Blazers fan to be like ecstatic about. And not that yeah. Dean and DJ aren't anything to be ecstatic about, but sure. when you have somebody like Mello who brings that experience and that the name to Portland to a place that has always passed on the people with the name. Okay. It's like, okay, you know, this is So like were you excited on a basketball level too? Did you think that he would work? Cause I think he's worked out like pretty well for you guys. Honestly, did you think that it was going to work out that way when you guys signed him? I personally did, but the, a lot of people did not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the chemistry between, like, the team of Mello and Dame with their veteran leadership for the other guys has been such a good combination, especially amidst um, Nurk and Zach being hurt, that we really needed somebody with a little bit more height that could also be a shooter and give Hassan his due. You know what I mean? Were you worried about the defense? at all in terms you know it's not adding a lot defensively a little bit but I think that he also I think a little bit with Mello he's driven by his the loyalty and the love that he feels from his teammates and I think that his relationship with Dame has a lot to do with the effort that Mello has put into playing defense because that was like the number one thing that I heard from Nuggets fans and Knicks fans was like, yeah, have fun with that. Like he doesn't play defense, but he's proved to actually be putting in the work in Portland. It's not like he wants to be in the NBA. Like he, I think he really like, he just wants to be in the NBA and he obviously works harder. He wouldn't even be, you know, he wouldn't be the greatness that he already was slash is. And guys love playing with Melo. Yeah. So I'm, I was I was a little bit, I was skeptical. I was on the other end, but you know, people that I really trusted were like, no, nah, this is going to work out. Like I'm yeah. hearing his mindset's completely different. It's going to work out. And I mean, it worked out until the season got canceled, but I know. I know. who knows I how it always is with the Blazers. Like whenever we have a good thing going, there's always like something drastic happens, right? Like it's just, you guys it's and just Clippers fans have that in, have that in common. I had a lot of Clippers fans are like, this would be the year. I'm like, well, <laughs> I can't help you, buddy. <laughs> well, you don't win the championships with would be. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> gotta, gotta be a could be. <laughs> um, so when did you know or like have an idea? Um, I'm sure it was probably like many of us that are within NBA and basketball. It was pre probably pretty early on. But when did you know that sports journalism and like sports freelancing 
was where you wanted to be career wise? Um, I think I still don't know, to be honest with you. Like if we're being completely transparent, I, I love sports. I think that I fell into a lot of it almost because I started, I can't like totally name what it was, but let's just say before I had a Twitter, I tried out for this basketball show that was pretty like well-known-ish, at least like within digital circles. And I didn't get it, but I made it all the way to the final round and it was just this like sort of exhilarating feeling where I was like damn I could just be on camera and just talk sports that's so cool so then I kind of told myself well you know I feel like if I had more of a name this opportunity I would have like been in a better position to get it beyond talent and more so also on like you know being a person with a platform so I built the platform off of making too many jokes and then it's obviously like evolved with me in terms of like the way that I use it and you know just what I decide to talk about and I think with everything that's happened recently, it's been this sort of wake up call of like, it's, I don't know what I want to do with sports necessarily in the long term, but it's always been good to me. So I think, I don't know how to say this in like a totally eloquent way, but there's something nice about being able to keep something you love as a fandom. Yeah. And less as like, a, yeah, I don't know if I necessarily always want it to be the rent payer, but the best advice I've ever gotten from someone is like, all, always be questioning yes. what you want to do. Like you don't have to be completely sure in yourself 24 seven and that's how you grow. And if you feel like you're in a position that's ever like not, you're not growing or you don't want to, you're not happy with it anymore or the industry or whatever. And I'm not saying that's the case for sports, but I'm saying oh. that that's like with everything that's been going on, it's been on my mind and I'm yeah. just like, we'll see. Yeah, no, I think, I think that is actually a really fresh perspective on it because I think in a way, I feel like you've described pretty much everybody that has a career in sports is that for all of us, it started as a hobby. It started as something that we talked about because we saw a super exciting game one day and then from then we just couldn't stop watching, you know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. in a way, I feel like almost everybody in sports in sports journalism or sports reporting what however you see it um their careers are almost always undefined in a way because I mean like look at look at Erin Andrews for example like she started with ESPN was one of the most popular reporters ever for ESPN and now she's over with Fox News and like like nobody ever talks about her (laughs) you know what I mean so it's like one of those things where as a journalist or you know sports hobbyist however you look at it you kind of have to always be ready to evolve because the leagues and how sports are covered are always evolving too sure and it's never linear like I think that's um there was a podcast that discussed it that and I'm not a journalist by any means I you know I occasionally talk on a podcast which is super fun but I you know there used to be more of like a not direct path but more of a clear path whereas now it's so it's like everybody has their own way of making it into sports. And like, there's so many avenues for you to be a part of sports. Um, And it's complete, you're right. It's like completely undefined right now, Um, which is, oh my God, it was a Capri Sun straw thing. (laughs) It's okay. I'm so glad this is on video. But but yeah, (laughs) so that was my professional advice. Ignore the Capri Sun. Professional people drink Capri Sun too. But um. But yeah, it's undefined. And I think, you know, you never just, if you're somebody that's looking to get into sports journalism, I'm I'm not the best person to give anybody advice, but I'll say the best advice that was ever given to me in any, any sort of entertainment profession is like, keep creating, keep working, keep, you know, uh, putting yourself out there and the opportunities should hopefully present themselves. Yeah. And I'm with you on that. I feel like the best advice I was ever given is in a nutshell to kind of just go for it like whatever it is that you think you want to do in sports or you know whatever you want to talk about in sports to just go for it I mean like this podcast is a really really good example of that considering the fact that I still don't have a microphone but here I am on episode (laughs) (laughs) I love that I actually do have the microphone it's just the software to get the microphone to the computer screwed me so it was yeah I stopped just... trying to use like the crazy I'm just on my headphones like at this yeah. point I've given yeah. up yeah. yeah so it was like that exactly I had to just kind of go with it and just do it because the longer you wait the longer it's gonna be until you get 
to where you want to be. So you kind of just have to go and just start talking about it because eventually the right people are going to hear you. Yep. I mean, I think about like Mindy Kaling and this is not sports at all. Mindy Kaling and please don't quote me because I read her book so long ago, but she (laughs) talked about, um, and I mean, I love the Mindy project and I loved her on the office obviously, but she talked about how she was essentially discovered for just putting on a play with friends in I think New York city. And then people liked it. And that led to her eventually getting the job on the office, which obviously led to all of her other big breaks. Like you really just don't, you don't know. And like, you know, your work is being discussed in rooms when you don't even know it. So just keep be creating content. As long as you're enjoying yourself, that should really be just like the, the key. So true. And I think it shines through in your content or whatever you're talking about, or if you're writing blogs or doing blogs or, you know, making sports content with people, you know, images of players or something like that, like whatever it is you're doing, if you think that it's sick and dope, it's going to like shine for you. You know what I mean? So exactly. And I, I fully agree with that. And I also actually think that that is, well, uh, on my assumption is probably a little bit of what led you to want, not need. Am I wrong to say that? In terms of creating things? Yeah. Um, yeah. So want, not need was so, well, okay. (laughs) Let me (laughs) me tell you about want, not need. So it basically started with, Um, I saw a giving thread on Twitter and I was, I wanted to buy myself a coffee maker, but I was like, okay, instead of buying myself a coffee maker, I'm going to donate the money that I would have spent. And also wait, okay, I have some more disposable funds. Let me just donate them to individuals. I got DMS of people and you know, it wasn't, none of these were crazy amounts. It was like $50 per person. And then one of them DM'd me with a picture of all the groceries that she was able to buy. And she was like, I was able to buy all of this. And I bought medicine for my dad. And I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, that was the cost of the coffee maker, essentially, which just like, I, you know, always, there is, I think I've always tried to make sure that I'm giving something, but I never thought about it in the concept of like, there's this material item I really maybe wanted, but just genuinely didn't need. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to take it as a personal habit. I can see like how far a dollar stretches. So instead of you know, I'm going to try to donate the cost or percentage of cost of an item that I know that I could afford and I want, but I really don't need it. And especially now, you know, I'm, I'm locked down in this house very fully. Like I'm yeah. not going anywhere. I really don't need shoes. I really don't need another coffee maker. I'm literally so caffeinated right now. So that's obviously like the best right. example. So I talked to Shivani about it. Who's my co-founder. And she was like, Shivani's the most incredible person. Please follow her on Twitter, Shivani Bonfal. I really hope I didn't mess up, but it's Shivani and then B-A-N-F-A-L. Okay. I'll, I'll, whatever, we'll, I'll okay. figure it out. But um, one of the most amazing people, she's been an activist and organizer for like five years. So she, she knows. And she was just like, this is dope. Let's like actually talk about it. And we decided to blow it up and make it into like a full blown thing. And I think we didn't know how people would resonate with it at all in terms of like donate the cost. You know, it's supposed to be a habit similar to like pay it forward where it's very easy, like not a ton of money at a time, just like $5 here and there adds up. Um, And people resonated with it so much that we had to like essentially change the rotation and the funding rounds that we do. Cause at first we were like every week we're going to fund one organization and we're going to rotate every week. But we were raising so much money that we were like, well, damn, we could just split it between the five orgs and give them like a thousand dollars at a time, which is a lot of money to the orgs yeah. that we choose because they're smaller grassroots don't have the national attention, you right. know, especially with COVID relief. A lot of them are just food assistance, housing assistance, like a thousand dollars goes a really long way. Yeah. Um, and it all comes from really small donations. So it's just been I, neither one of us knew that this was going to like actually be a thing. A thing yeah yeah well but. and that's so awesome too because for somebody like me who um I grew up uh, most of my life with a single mom and for somebody like me who I always saw that single mom despite our obstacles and hardships she was always you know volunteering she was always buying you know to picking names off Christmas trees to give you know Christmas presents to the need you know less fortunate and um you know all all these different things that I watched my mom do to give back to the community through growing up somebody like me finds a little less meaning in doing something 
as simple as I'm going to pay for the person behind me's coffee in line today. Because right. the way I see it is somebody who's going to get coffee usually does that pretty regularly. And to buy their coffee isn't really meaningful to them because it's something they do every single day. Mm -hmm. So to have a little bit more of an impact on giving, not that randomly paying for somebody's coffee isn't a nice gesture. It doesn't really sure. help. Needed. I was going to say like, you're inching towards the fact that how does, how does our giving actually maximize the impact, which yeah. is like why, you know, trusting community organizers is always the, like they're, they're in their community. They know how to stretch the dollar and they know what the community needs. Yeah, uh, so that's where like the impact goes the furthest. So for sure. Yeah. And that's why I love that's what was so I think endearing to me and so um, intriguing about what you guys put together with want not need is because not only did I see that you were kind of trying to adjust and you know, you said, you know, you guys did some things with COVID and you guys have donated to, to some of the Black Lives Matter organizations and some of the people that have been um, at protests and helping with protesters and things like that. And so I think that, like you said, to be aware of these different groups that are finding specific needs within communities makes so much more of an impact than just like, you know, buying somebody's random coffee behind you. Like I 100%. said, that's not a great gesture, but to actually give back and make a difference in a community or in a community that you're a part of, something like want not need is like profound, I think. Aww, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I really, I just, I think that what you guys are doing is so great. And so to kind of close out the episode, talk a little bit about, um, what other types of organizations you guys are going to be working with down the road so that the audience can kind of keep their eyes out and potentially follow the funds so that they can be a part of those. Sure. So we haven't picked any specific organizations right now, but you know, we kind of go by based on immediate need. Yeah. So it started with COVID relief and mind you, COVID relief is going to be a necessary thing for us to keep in the back of our mind for a while. Right. Uh, we've committed to working with at least one organization every single rotation that goes directly toward, like, to the Black community and, you know, the long-term effects of police brutality. Or, you know, for example, we're talking about looking into organizations that are doing legal aid right now and trying to just, like, there's, I don't even have to explain to people if you're even yeah. online a little bit, you understand what's going on. There's bail funds that actually still need some cash. Um, so there's just, like, keeping our pulse in terms of what the need is, which is why I feel so lucky that Shivani is in this with me because I'm not as I'm not as dialed into this world where yeah. she has her ears on the ground in terms of like, is it food assistance? Is it legal aid? Is it shelter? Like what is the current need? And you know, we work on two week rotation, so it's easy for us to just like la la la. Um and we're also like we're still in the process of 501 C three, but we're not yeah. as like we're not very how do I say this without sounding? Cause this is like a positive thing. We're not yeah. like, here are the rules. We have to do it this way. Cause right, right. for example, we're in the middle of a two, like we're one week into our two week rotation right now, but we are working with two activists and organizers in Chicago that are running um, food banks and are just literally like going and getting groceries and yeah. making food and giving it to students. And they needed some support now. So we were like, here, like we don't even have to wait for the two weeks please like go whatever yeah. way we could support. Um, and you know, these are just individuals out of their own pocket trying to, trying to make a difference. Uh, and that's really what we're all about is like, like, please. And like anybody that we can help really. And like, in what way can we help you? Yeah. Um, and you know, we're always looking for nominations on our website. Like if you work with an organization that you know could use some funding, like huh. come to us. Perfect. I was just going to ask that. Yep. Like we, we love nominations again. Like we don't, you know, we can't know possibly every single amazing person that's doing work out there. We oh, were like, so lucky that the organizers in Chicago knew Shivani and knew to reach out to her. Um, but otherwise like on whatnotneedfund.com, you could nominate organizations. Yeah. And I, I, I encourage everyone to, because I want to keep this going for as long as humanly possible. So we're going to run through a lot of organizations. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Well, um, do know that you guys have a lifelong supporter in myself and Sports Talk Mostly podcast. So thank you. Anything that you guys need to come on and talk about, um, if you need us to 
post something, retweet something, anything like that, please let us know. Cause I totally, totally dig what you guys are doing. I think it's awesome. And I also think that it creates a really positively introspective way for somebody to really ask themselves what they need and if what they need is really that important because I think our society is so stuck on material and let me fix this and let me fix that and it's like do you really need to fix that or do you really need a new one Um, right and it's a lot of like now that because you know in general we could talk all day and I think wants do make our life beautiful like I always try to add that that like wants add you know they add life to our life. I know that's a really dumb sentence, yeah. but they do like, they add, they give us joy and that's, that's fucking beautiful. However, like, especially now with the discrepancy between the things that you want and the things that you really need are just so great. Like really, you're right. It's about that self-reflection. And, you know, ultimately, even if want not need fund becomes a habit for someone and they're using that habit to donate to an organization that has nothing to do with us. Fuck. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, it's about, it's about a habit. It's not about us. Well, and I think to go along with what you were saying about, like, the wants and how they add life to your life, it's also a very fine line between wanting something because you want to grow a little bit or maybe explore something and wanting something out of insecurity or trying to make yourself feel better. And I think our society places so much value on the material things and, like, um, uh, like retail therapy and like shopping as a form of like oh I'm sad or I had a bad day so let me go shop or go which to- relatable I do that all the time I used I to do too. I do too and then I stop uh, like you guys made me think just by like talking about your fun you know what I mean so it's just one of those things that I think like I said to be positively introspective and really ask a, a person do I want this because I really, am I really trying to like fulfill a need or fulfill something that it can help me long term? Even if I want it, is it something that's going to be, you know, if I buy this coffee maker to use your example, is it like, how is this going to benefit me a year from now? You know what sure. I mean? It's disposable. And then, practice. Mm-hmm. and then also like, if you, if you know, if your answer to that question is like, well, I don't really I don't like, I just kind of like, I, I, I had like a fleeting want for it, then, okay, cool. But you've already in your mind parted with that $50. So you know that you can afford it. So like put it towards something else or even a percentage of it, because I get it. Like none of, we're not trying to like burden people financially. It's really about like recognizing the little times throughout the day where you spend like $5 here or Mind you, I was playing like bubble shooter or whatever it's called. And I was spending a ton of money on extra lives. So like yeah. things like yeah. that, that, like maybe I should just be better at the game and then I can donate the money. I really, I stopped playing. I deleted it off my phone. I, I sucked. But oh, I played it for hours. Because you hours. just totally blindly called me out with Farmville. <laughs> oh, wait, this far I have never played, but do they like, is it a lot of like inner purchase or whatever? Stupid oh, and addicting. <laughs> you're like, I would never pay for an app, but then there's, oh my God, wait, there's this one called like Stack, I think. And you literally, it's so, I've gotten, I, ugh, I'm so good, but I spent <laughs> like too many hours playing that. But because I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to watch all these ads. Now I'm paying to just not have the ads so I could just like mindlessly. Anyways, so it's about recognizing the moments where you're behaving like me. Yeah. And you're like, well, maybe, you know, $2 could go here. And now if you do that once a week, $2 a week is not a lot for a lot of people that have that type of disposable income. But then it's like $8 a month to us means a lot more because that could pay for food. Mm -hmm. So that's $8 on top of somebody else's 20, somebody else's 15 and somebody else's 50, somebody else's five. It adds up quick. We've never, you know, the biggest, well, actually, it's like the biggest donation we've gotten is pretty sizable. Shout out to someone that was literally like, here's my sneaker budget. And I'm like, eh. but, um, you know, sizable for the, for the week, people that have sneaker budgets for the week is like the perfect example of just like, you really don't need sneakers right now. Um, the funniest donation we got was like, this is all the money I would have spent on Tinder dates if I didn't get banned from Tinder two years ago. This person, this is one of my like best friends from home. He got banned on Twitter two years ago, and he's just like, "Well, this is what I think I would have spent." I'm like, <laughs> "And like, you're the best, and this is all in the same spirit." Um, but yeah, exactly. Like, 
it just it stacks on top of each other five dollars ten dollars here and there like one person was donating uh all the money that they weren't spending on iced coffee for the week they did that for two weeks and that right there was 40 something dollars which wow. is a lot of money for you know communities that are just trying to like feed people totally. um so yeah anyways totally yeah Super. no I agree I love it and thank you so much for coming on to talk about that and please make sure to send me your co-founders info so I can make sure to plug both of yes. you guys in the description for the show and stuff like that um but since NBA is making a comeback we uh. traditionally sign off all guest interviews with a prediction and so I'm gonna make you do it like who's gonna be the champion? Then? Gonna take playoffs this year. Who's gonna be our NBA champ of ah. COVID nineteen twenty twenty? Well, I'm still hoping that the league cancels the season, but um, I don't think it's safe. <laughs> uh, and I hate that we're compromising health for entertainment. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Lakers. Side note before you answer the prediction question, I'm just yes. really curious. Also, I'm not even 100% sure if they are actually even part of the teams that made it through. But if the Jazz are playing, like, does anybody even want to play with Rudy Gobert? I honestly, so I was hearing so many conflicting reports about, I don't know if guys <laughs> still blame him. I don't know. Like, you know, we heard reports that are like, they're blaming him. They're not blaming him. I have no idea. I also think that all these guys are professional. So, like, they will play. Yeah, if they and so many of them want to play basketball and you know they're a team at the end of the day but um I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Lakers I really like you would say that (laughs) yeah I I started off the season pretty skeptical and I was very like it's gonna be the Clippers but but I could see like I could see Clippers Lakers or Bucks like I really just don't know but let's just say Lakers you say that because I did start off the season out of the Clippers and the Lakers. I thought the Clippers would be better this season. And now I'm like, man, I am of the crowd that would not complain to see the Lakers take the championship because okay. of the pass away. But I don't know. As a Blazers fan, I'm like, do can I say that? Is that allowed? <laughs> yeah, screw it. You know, we're at a point where, like, we just want good basketball. Even actually, I don't want basketball at all right now. I want safe basketball. But if we have to get basketball, hopefully it'll be good basketball. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Okay. Well, it's on recording, so we'll see how your answer pans out. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love every time you do like a anybody that does like a prediction thing. I'm like, well, damn it, like it's gonna be wrong, and then everyone's gonna be like, here's a clip of you saying it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's okay because if anybody tries to give you shit. You just go ahead and direct them to my Christmas Day predictions. What was your I, Christmas? I went. Uh, but Christmas I Day was crazy. The Warriors beat the Rockets. Didn't really beat the Bucks. Right. Okay, but give yourself like honestly, don't feel bad about that one because Christmas Day was actually insane. And the only one I got right was the Warriors winning. <laughs> Wait, you predicted? That's crazy. The I have. I thought it was going to be, uh, I mean, the Rockets are good and the Warriors sucked and they, whatever, that was so funny. What a great day for me. Anyway, <laughs> great day. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for your time and coming on here. We appreciate you. And hopefully we'll get to interview you guys again soon for doing more awesome things. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. It was so, so, so fun. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Yes. God, I hope you guys like that interview with Nitz. She is just such a ball of joy. I love her personality so much. Um, Definitely also please go follow her, her co-founder, and her fund, Want Not Need Fund, on Twitter and Instagram. I'm definitely going to try to uh, plug their social media in the description down below in the video, podcast, wherever you're listening to. Check the description for their info. Uh, please and thank you so much because they're doing such amazing things and using their platforms for such good. So this is definitely the type of stuff we love to see, type of stuff I love to see as the host of Sports Talk Mostly podcast. That is the reason why the podcast is called Sports Talk Mostly, so that people within sports can use the sports platform 
to talk about other things that they do in life. Um, and that honestly kind of brings us to the culture aspect of the episode. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys can guess, but the biggest culture related thing that is going on right now around sports is Black Lives Matter. Um, I have a black man on my shirt today. Uh, the sports that we talk about, basketball, football, baseball, track, I mean, those are the majority. Hockey is another one. Obviously, um, you know, black people are a minority within hockey, but there is so much diversity within hockey that um, it just goes right along with it, that there's so many athletes that their talents alone allow white people to succeed and allow white people to make a living that I personally believe that if you're working in sports and you are not standing up for black lives, that you're a walking contradiction. And, um, frankly, it's one of those things for me. It's not a matter of disagreement. Um, it's not, this isn't talking about whether or not you like or dislike coffee. It's not talking about whether or not you like or dislike chocolate. This is a human rights issue. And frankly, if you disagree with me, it's personal. Um... I love to see athletes like Damian Lillard, DeMar DeRozan. I mean, there's been handfuls of them out there, literally, physically, on the streets, protesting next to their fans and the people that look up to them, the people that scrutinize them, the people that um, say, oh, you know, if he can't make that free throw, I just, I'm not going to, you know, pay attention to him or root for him. They were out there protesting with those types of people. And at the end of the day, when you have an athlete that is out there protesting for those types of things, people's opinion on the way that they play their, like, preferred sport is fucking irrelevant, to be honest with you. At that point, it literally only matters that they're using their platform to do good, to promote good, to promote equality, to promote change of a deeply rooted systemic issue that our country was built upon. And as Americans, if you are a sports fan, the Black Lives Matter movement should be relevant to you. <clears throat> and, you know, I think Kyrie Irving had really good intentions to say that you know right now it's not the time for basketball and all of those things I see that but like I said uh at the news portion of the episode I really think that this is a time where not to use basketball as a distraction but to use basketball as a tool to show that unity is possible as a tool to show that people of different cultures and different backgrounds can come together and unite for a common goal. I think basketball and sports in general is a really, really good example of that. And I hope that these men, I mean, LeBron, Kelly Oubre, Spencer Dinwiddie, Damian Lillard, I mean, all of these guys, I'm trying to think of like the guys who are like the biggest, most popular guys on their team you know they're going to be using this television time and this interview time to talk about these issues. And I think that that is so important. And that if basketball is going to come back right now, that those, those guys should be able to have that platform to talk about what's important to them. And that kind of brings me to my next point in the Black Lives Matter topic realm is Colin Kaepernick. And again, ties back to sports. And if you guys have been following me for a while, you probably know my stance on this. I 
am and was and have been and will be a huge Colin Kaepernick supporter. He was highly misunderstood. His reasoning and his intent was highly misunderstood. And there was multiple people who completely misconstrued his intent in kneeling and completely overlooked how he came to that decision and are now seeing what Colin Kaepernick was referring to. And that's not bad. It's not bad to see someone's perspective and to finally understand it. But it's bad to have been a part of the brigade that said, get that son of a bitch off the field. And now are in the Black Lives Matter brigade without even owning up to any of the negativity that you were co-signing in the past. Like I said, it's great to change your stance, but also take accountability for the misinformation that you were siding with. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are football fans that were like, this is not the time and place, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Oh, I agree with him, but it's not the time and place. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, well, if you agree with them, then let him say what he has to say. Who cares where he says it? Who cares if it's his job? Like, oh, shut up and do your job. It's like, uh, what was her name? Laura Graham or Laura Ingram or whatever the hell her name is. I'm probably going to get grilled for not knowing. But the uh, Fox News anchor that told LeBron, shut up and dribble. I mean, it's the same shit. Nobody likes when they kneel. Nobody likes when they wear an I can't breathe shirt. You don't like when they burn down your building. So how the hell are black people supposed to get your attention and supposed to get you to understand why they're kneeling. So that's my take on it. Obviously, I hugely side with Black Lives and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I don't think it's up for uh, misinterpretation. I think it's a very straightforward thing. You either support it or you don't. And, um, I really want to take this moment and this episode to elevate that and to draw attention to the fact that this podcast wouldn't exist without Black Lives. So please understand that when you're listening to my show and when you're listening to my opinions. And um, please know that I will always acknowledge Black Lives and I will always make a space for Black Voices. And if you guys didn't, please go check out episode eight, which was called The Lost Episode with Avery Owens. He's a very amazing, very professional um, black designer with FanDuel and also a very good friend of mine. <clears throat> so please go check out episode eight. I know it's been a little tumultuous since COVID-19 closures, but episode eight is it was what <laughs> what was going on in the world before COVID-19 happened and then everything shut down and I didn't even have time to blink to put out the rest of the episode with it. I just put out <laughs> the interview, put it out last week. Um, so go check that out and please remember that this podcast and this platform will always be a space for um, black voices around sports and sports culture so if you are or if you know somebody who is that and would like to come on the podcast to talk about anything that they are doing please send me a message let me know you can contact me on the sports talk sports talk mostly podcast pages or my personal pages um pretty responsive on either one and thanks for listening as always um sorry again the episodes are going to be kind of short to start with but 
just want to get back into the groove of things and make sure that I'm not rambling on <laughs> topics because hopefully you guys are starting to get back to working back, back in the gym. So I want to make sure I'm using your time wisely when you lend me your ear to listen to Sports Talk Mostly podcast. So again, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Nitz. Please go follow her and her co-founder and her fund, Want Not Need Fun, on all of their social media pages. And don't forget to subscribe to Sports Talk Mostly Podcast on Patreon. That way you can check out the secret segment 10 question edition that I've added to the show. And hopefully you guys can get to know the interview guests just a little bit better on a personal level. So, again, thanks for listening. I love you all. Black Lives Matter.